Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to Adherent First and 15. For us, it's a good afternoon because it's 3 p.m., but uh, we have connected Professor Richard Harvey from Australia, which is uh, thinking uh, that is going uh, pretty late, so it's a good, uh, good evening for you. Good evening. Thanks okay. for having me. Yeah, it's a pleasure for us. I've, I've requested uh, Professor Harvey to have a, a talk on a, on a um, pretty good and uh, interesting topic. It's a microbiome on the sinonasal diseases. So I would uh, let him talk for, the, for, his, uh, um, uh, for his talk for 30 minutes. And uh, please do remind that all the questions should be done at the end of his talk. Please go ahead with your presentation. Thank you. No, thanks very much for having me. You know, I, I am perhaps, perhaps the, uh, an unlikely speaker for the microbiome. It's a bit like asking AC Grayling to talk about the importance of religion or Donald Trump to discuss climate change. I'm not a big believer, but when we have a look at the number of publications on the microbiome, this is from my colleague, Richard Douglas, who's done some really nice work in this field. You can see that there's an enormous amount of publications. It has dropped off in recent years, though, having reached a peak about five years ago. But I am a self-confessed slight microbiome denier. And a little bit, this is from a causality perspective. And I'll try to explain this um, as through my talk. Now, we were sold some of these figures from microbiome reviews to discuss how the fungal, bacterial, and viral microbiome all contribute to respiratory health. And while I have no doubt that the microflora does modify the disease process, I'm not really a a convert to the idea that the microflora is the cause of the disease process. Now, microbiome is a very topical subject. Uh, it affects many parts of the body. We're aware now that bacteria, microorganisms, including virus and fungi, exists in all sorts of different disease states. Now, we know that in burns, people get terrible infective complications from burns and they get biofilms and the microbiome occurs in the broken skin surface. Same occurs in psoriasis and skin conditions. And even the microbiome of cystic fibrosis, both in the upper and lower airway has been well described. But I think it's very important that just because these states differ greatly from normal, the dysbiosis associated with these conditions doesn't actually imply causation. It just means that these conditions have a a factor going on that creates a dysbiosis. And just the dysbiosis itself does not mean it's a cause of the conditions. And certainly we understand in burns and psoriasis and cystic fibrosis that the disrupted bacteria is not the cause of these conditions. Now, I feel that way because like many CRS researchers who run air liquid interface labs, uh, Noam Cohen, Rob Schleimer, Rob Kern, Brad Woodworth, Rod Schloss, there'd be a whole bunch of them. We, we culture out these cells from our patients into what's called an air liquid interface. Now, they go through many passages. And when we talk about passages, it means that they are like the, uh, the great, great granddaughters and children of the original cells they came from, grown in perfect environments, yet many generations on, these cells behave very differently. Um, Sijad Amazada, who published this paper, it was a bit of an underwhelming study, but I said to him, you know, one of the fascinating things though is just to see how different the cell lineages between normals and CRS patients still behave abnormally in the lab. Many, many, many passages, many, many generations away from when they were actually, the cells were actually living in the host. And so it goes to show even with a perfect micro environment, these cells behave differently. Now, I do have some microbiome research. Uh, I was very fortunate to be part of Alki Saltis's International Cyanonasal Microbiome Study. This actually only recently been published. Um, there was 13 centers over five continents, 410 patients. There's Sydney right there. We contributed, like everyone did, to CRS with polyps, without polyps, and control patients. 
Now, this is a big slide. I do realize this watching it. Um, it really shows up here the genera by diagnosis and genera by center, showing you know what was the abundance, the relative abundance of different genera of bacteria. And really, this study showed across all countries, the majority of the abundance of bacteria are really made up by Coronobacterium, Staphylococcus species, and that includes Staph aureus, Staph epidermis, Craculase positive and negative, Streptococcus species, and Haemophilus. They were the four most abundant bacteria across all different disease states. You can see here controls pop without polyps and polyps. And it was very, very similar across the sites, except for Amsterdam. And we can talk about that. Amsterdam had a slightly higher preponderance towards uh, staph. Now, that core cyanonasal biome, if you have a look at it here, the coronabacteria made up a large proportion, but then when you added in the strep, the staph, and the haemophilus, and even Moraxella, you really then accounted for 98% or more of the bacteria that were living in these sinuses across 13 different countries here and centers, or five, five continents and 13 different centers. But we couldn't find any relationship between the microbial composition and other disease states. So other comorbid states such as asthma, aspirin sensitivity, diabetes, smoking, primary surgery, reflux, there was no association to be found. Now, there are many other studies that have been done, and there's actually 11 here. Richard Douglas, once again, my colleague in uh, Auckland in New Zealand, down in my part of the world, has done some really nice work. He published a meta-analysis of the 11 studies in the literature that looked between, not always between healthies and CRS, sometimes just CRS, and they looked at what was happening to the microbiome in these, in these studies between control patients with CRS and healthy patients without CRS. And here on the right hand side, a, a common finding is that the diversity and richness is decreased in CRS patients. So richness and diversity of bacteria is lower in these red boxes here compared to healthy controls. And that's that was a reasonably common finding throughout the 11 meta-analysis and was reflected when they put it all together as a, as a collective group. This is one of these scatter plots that looks at diversity. I actually don't understand these plots at all. It's way too above my pay grade, but that was a common finding that Richard Douglas found. So he came up with this conclusion that CRS is a dysbiotic and ecologic network fostering healthy communities that become fragmented. Now, he also came up that he thought that the most abundant from his analysis was staph, coronabacterium, streptococcus, and a propionum bacteria. He felt, looking at these 11 studies, that maybe this linear discriminant analysis of some sort of effect size, now once again, I'm, I'm not a statistical uh, I'm not even able to provide a statistical explanation of exactly what this means. But I think at the end of the day, it's a histogram of, of bacterial taxa that differentiate between CRS and healthy. And they found that in CRS, you had a loss of coronabacterium. And in healthies, you had a gain of coronabacterium and propionumbra bacterium and actinobacter. So, so this is from his analysis of, the, of different studies taken across different sites. This is what he came down. So once again, he reflected this richness and diversity is being lost. Now, our study though, that Alki headed up, Saltus, we really couldn't see this. So when we looked at the disease states, so this is non-polyps, polyps and controls. We really couldn't find diversity differed across the 13 different centers who contributed to this microbiome study with standardized collection between all centers. But what we could see was the diversity did differ by which site you had your, 
specimen taken at. And I think this raises a real issue that here we have now, as opposed to Richard's meta-analysis where different techniques were used to measure the microbiome, but we have a, a study with, which is multi-center, in which they all use the same technique that found actually the center was far more important than actually even the disease state in looking at diversity. Now that's a real issue because it may reflect practice patterns such as use of antibiotics in different centers, different types of patients and what treatments have been on rather than the disease and the microbiome reflecting the disease process. Now, this is hot off the press here. This is February, 2020, just been published in the International Forum of Allergy and Rhinology. It's a nice study looking at the association of the cyanonasal bacterial microbiome with clinical features. So this group here um, found nine studies. The most common clinical outcome that the microbiome was associated with was the SNOT22, and they looked at relationships there. Now, I want to show you here that in this study, one study here, this is only just three of the eight, but one study found that coronabacterium, its association with patients was was positively correlated with poor symptoms. Copeland, a recent one, said it was negatively associated with symptoms. And Deviani Lau study said it wasn't related to symptoms. So there's yet to be really any clear guidance here as to whether or not you, if you have a skew in your microbiome, whether that be in a certain genera, a certain abundance of one type of bacteria, it, it doesn't really reflect on at least symptoms in CRS patients um, compared to controls. And so the conclusion of this meta-analysis and systematic review was really a systematic review is that at present, there is no clear and consistent relationship between the cyanonasal microbiome of CRS patients and their quality of life or symptoms. Now, this is important because I've raised two issues here that sight makes a difference, uh, not always the disease process and um, although diversity may be reduced in many of these percenters, you may have to ask why. Is it really the disease process that's reduced the diversity? I think it's very possible it is. But CRS patients differ from normals for a whole lot of reasons, not just their disease. They differ because they've been given antibiotics often many times by both their primary carer and the doctors that look after them. They've been given corticosteroids. They've often had surgery. So things have happened to their sinus cavity where normals haven't. They often are using topical treatments such as irrigations. And all of these things are likely to affect then the subsequent microbiome that is seen between CRS patients and normal patients. Now, a big question for me is that I, I think this issue is that does the lost barrier integrity of the, affect the microbiomes? Now, we know that normal patients have beautiful epithelium that's intact and CRS patients begin to get this broken down epithelium. We think it's part of the problem. Uh, but this is not new for CRS. This is like some dermatitis conditions. Once your psoriasis gets like this, you sure do get secondary infections. It's a common part of the disease process and well recognized. Now we published, this is another study we did with Alki's help. It was a little side project. I said to Alki, I said, if we're gonna collect all these microbiomes on our patients, Let's see if there's any association between severity of the disease and the eosinophilia. So we looked at the degree of eosinophilia and the severity of disease as reported on the histopathology, so our standard histopathology system. So the first thing we looked at then was his degree of inflammation, mild, moderate, severe, and tissue eosinophilia, less than 10, 10 to 100, greater than 100. And there really wasn't a huge difference in the terms of relative abundance of bacteria between the different groups. And these are the main ones here. This is this rich richness phenomenon. So richness did decrease with increasing inflammation. So as you went from mild to severe and richness did decrease with tissue eosinophilia as you went from low eosinophilia to high eosinophilia. And really, I think this is going from, 
mild disease through to severe disease. Uh, diversity followed very close. Diversity was associated with um, uh, increasing inflammation, but didn't quite reach um, significance here when it came to eosinophilia. So we found that the worse your condition is, the worse your diversity and your richness findings were, the more dysbiotic you were. But that's probably no different than saying someone's psoriasis is bad and therefore the degree of bacteria living on their skin is going to be worse. We did then try to go and say, well, in these groups, those who had very high tissue eosinophilia, were they colonized with a certain bug? I mean, Staph aureus is perhaps the one here that's been most well studied over the years. We do know that Staph enterotoxins can induce a TH2 response, but really we couldn't see that in our study of 89 patients. Now, that's not to say that just because we didn't see it, someone else has. So Klaus Backett and Thibault's group did something very, very similar. So they looked at the microbiome and they looked at it polyp patients with and without asthma. Now, I would actually portend that this is almost exactly like our study. These are eosinophilic patients, polyp patients mostly, probably. And those with asthma just have more severe disease. And in, and in this study here, they're also, a third of them have aspirin, aspirin exacerbated airway disease. So it's really looking at eosinophilic patients with even more severe disease. And of course, they did the cytokine analysis that showed that they're obviously more eosinophilic. They have a worse disease profile on cytokines course. We expect that with polyps with asthma and also have aspirin, aspirin exacerbated disease. And then they showed, very similar to us, that diversity and richness were affected based on which group you were in. And the more severe you were, the more you were affected with the diversity. But it wasn't huge. And then they looked at the type of bacteria and they did feel that there were a couple of genera here, actinobacter, that were over or underexpressed based on which group you're in. So you can see here, it's the percentages here, perhaps the actinobacter here, you were less likely to have it if you had severe disease, where you're perhaps more likely to have propionobacter um, if you were to have disease. And so, but these once again don't line up in my reading from any other any of the other literature as well. But interesting findings here that with more severe disease, you tend to get colonized with different bugs. Now, once again, association doesn't prove causality. There's lots of things that affect our microbiome. Smoking, for instance, has been well known and described to affect the microbiome in the upper airway. So the, the upper airway would be the nasopharynx, um, or, or the saliva from the cigarettes themselves can actually show a difference between smokers and non-smokers. Now, once again, this comes down to this concept. Does the dysbiosis cause the inflammation? Now, this is important because if we're talking about correcting the dysbiosis, we would then want to see a response. We want our patients to get better. We wouldn't want to correct the dysbiosis just because it's there. Now, there is evidence of the success of probiotics and microbial transplants, but this world is almost limited to pseudomonal enterocolitis. So this is a condition brought on with someone who has a normal immune system and they get an overgrowth of clostridial difficile in their gut. Now, these patients do do well from transplant treatments. But this is not CRS. CRS is not a condition of just simply an overgrowth of one type of bacteria. It's interesting if you look at the gut literature, of course, there's been enormous amount of research done. And people have looked at probiotics and microbial transplants into inflammatory bowel disease. Now, inflammatory bowel disease to me is a much more complex disorder and I think much more similar to inflammatory airway disease. And really there are very poor effects on showing symptom response when it's applied here. Now, this slide has a nice pictures here from one of Rob Schleim and uh, Rob Kern's studies and papers. 
I just want to use this chance just to give a shout out to Witzke Fockens and the EPOS group. They just published their EPOS 2020 guidelines. And, you know, here we are talking about the microbiome, which has such, such thin knowledge and understanding. Yet EPOS did a great job at showing the mechanisms of inflammation of which we understand an enormous amount about and has been heavily researched and very well validated between different groups and consistent between different groups and different centers. And so the type one, type two, type three inflammatory responses uh, are laid out really nicely in the EPOS 2020 if you're looking for an update on, on some hardcore science behind CRS. Now, let's go to treatment then in my last couple of minutes here. So I, st I stole this from my colleague Anders Servan's paper when he talked about the potential for probiotic treatment. Now, he listed all the studies that probiotic therapies had been used. And you can see here, tonsillitis mouth spray, titus media nasal spray. I'm not, I'm not sure how that quite works. Titus media nasal spray, secretory titanius nasal spray, oral suspension and nasal spray for staph aureus carrying, nasal spray for cutis titus media, and one of his studies looking at microbiome and um, CRS they are, are all relatively very weak. Ruse is the one person who's been publishing for 20 years, amazingly, with positive results. No one else has really found significant findings between these groups. This group here, the Skovberg, I don't know the study that well, but the effect on secretiotitis was a very weak endpoint. This was no effect. This one was no effect. This one was no effect. So apart from the Ruse studies, there's really been very little success in topical probiotic therapy. So let's have a look at Anders Servan's study. So he did a really nice one here where they looked at the honeybee microbiome. So it was a, it was a combination microbiome. It was a randomized study. He used a hundred microliter spray in patients with non-polyp disease. He felt that that was gonna be the successful group, so CRS without polyps, but they really couldn't find any positive outcome here. There was no difference between the groups at the end of the treatment. Now, this is another question that comes up. Does the microbiome change when the disease is treated? So Vijay and Ramakrishna did this. So, so we know that just simply giving probiotics doesn't seem to help topically in the nose. But let's look at people who've actually treated patients using our traditional treatment regimes, such as surgery and local topical care. So here we are now, this is the gene copy. This is surgery, two weeks post, six weeks post. And I'm only really showing you this slide so you can understand the next one. So here we are now, this is the important one. This shows that this, this is, um, this vertical axis is, is, is the similarity between the baseline microbiome and, and the current microbiome. And so even though the patients in VJ study got better from their surgery and topical therapy, so their conventional treatment, their microbiome between baseline and six weeks was actually very, very similar. So it changed early on after surgery, but then very quickly came back to be very similar to their pre-surgery, pre-treatment microbiome state. So the question is, but they got better and they had their treatment. So that's very tricky to understand how then does, if the microbiome doesn't change in response to improvements of disease, how does it relate then to the actual disease process? Now, this is a really nice table and I'm, uh, I won't go through it too quickly here, now I put this table up because it contains Anderson's study on the honeybee probiotic spray, along with the only other probiotic study that I really know in the literature, which is an oral probiotic therapy done in CRS patients. And I think that Melissa Ponyan is actually on that paper. So an author who's been at CRS research for a long time. Now, both of these were negative studies. So these are, an oral probiotic and a topical nasal spray probiotic in the use in a randomized RCT for CRS. 
It is worthwhile though, pointing out all the other oral probiotic studies, many of them placebo controlled, that have been done in allergic rhinitis. And these are done in all sorts of different situations. Probiotics given to patients, given to patients with immunotherapy, given to mothers and to children, or children of atopic mothers. And, it, and it's actually a pretty consistent response. And so they all tend to show a little bit of a benefit in a, in a true RCT design. And so I think there probably really is a signal to noise there that probiotics when given orally probably do do something to our gut that helps us shift away from TH2 disease. But it's not about sticking in the nose or having it locally. And these are more with traditional atopic IgE mediated disease. Now, now, just before, if I, if I sound a little bit too down on the whole microbiome, I, I just want to put up this uh, uh, slide here. It's from, once again, my colleague, Richard Douglas, who's done some really nice work here. Uh, I'm not really convinced that dysbiosis that is seen in the microbiome of our patients is really contributing to their disease this, in, in a meaningful way. But I have no doubt that we probably do things to our patients, such as giving them too many antibiotics, we end up selecting out staph and pseudomonas, and we probably create problems with the microbiome that then probably lead to exacerbations and other issues. But, but I think it's all really a secondary effect, at least from my reading of the literature so far. So, so when it comes to treatment outcomes, Anders said, what should we really be expecting? Well, well, maybe the microbiome managing it might, might prevent us from getting bacterial complications from the cold. It's a possibility. Maybe it might improve CRS by helping to decolonize pathogens. So it's not really changing things, but it, it improves our understanding of how to use antibiotics or, or not use them as it may be. This is a tricky one. To, he proposed to reduce the eosinophilic inflammation in the airway. I, I'm not sure that there's evidence for that. And developing the onset of eosinophilic inflammation, I'm not convinced the microbiome and the dysbiosis has ever been ever shown to be involved in that pathway. So my position right now at this stage is it's a little bit like this. And if you don't know what this is, this is some people when they finish drinking their tea, they make a big deal about it and they say, well, where did my tea leaves fall? It tells me how sort of day and future I'm going to have this week. And if you don't quite understand how to read your tea leaves, you just need to get better equipment. So there's maps and special diagrams and even special cups to make sure you understand how your tea leaves are falling. And I think a little bit without being too cynical, I do think some of our understanding of microbiome flaws into this that it's a bit by chance alone about what's happening here, the differences between sites, between groups, between centers, such a variability that, that maybe this is such an individual thing, if it is at all um, going to be related to our patients' outcomes in the future. So does the microbiome differ between healthy and disease states? Well, within centers, it seems to, so because they practice a certain way, but internationally, it wasn't really for the disease, it was more for the site that it was taken from. The dysbiosis is associated with different disease states, with more severe disease, this is true. But is the dysbiosis causative? I would say right now, no more than the dysbiosis that occurs in these conditions. And we all know that the dysbiosis is not the cause of cystic fibrosis, it's secondary to the CTFR gene defect that occurs in those patients. And can the dysbiosis contribute to exacerbations? This is a tricky one. I would say maybe, but there's still really no evidence to suggest that that's the case. So look, thank you very much. And I'm happy to take questions a little bit as a self-confessed microbiome denier at the moment. Uh, I happen to be challenged because I, I don't know everything in this field. Well, thank you for your presentation. Brilliant um, work because of all of these uh, data and uh, diagrams and studies that you proposed. And I'm glad that you um, referred about the new EPOS classification just come uh, last week. <clears throat> and I do believe that uh, 
the what, what did you say about all this uh, uh, consideration about this uh, uh, microbiome stuff should be studied more. However, right now, it's uh, I do believe that what you said about uh, the within centers or I mean the, for diseases and site uh, is essential to get in there. Uh, the questions that, that we have are basically already been uh, uh, discussed from you because you completely um, uh, focus on management and uh, data and stuff like that. So I'm, I'm going through all of this. Uh, and uh, one of that comes to my attention that uh, came from Korea. And this colleague is asking, does the rhinovirus uh, um, change the microbiome in a patient that has a sinus infection also with bacterial infection? Does, does a rhinovirus, so the viral microbiome, was that the cause? Look, I actually don't know that well enough. All I can say is that there was, there's a Korean group from Cho et al who have published on CRS patients to show that there is an overexpression of viral particles found when we go looking now for them with genetic techniques. And so I, I, I do think that potentially here that the viral co-infection is probably going to play a big role, but that's probably not that new because if you think about asthma, viral induced exacerbations of asthma is very well established. And so the viral interface with asthmatics and not as a cause, cause of it, but as a, as a reason for exacerbation is very well researched by our respiratory colleagues. Uh, another question that comes, it's of course, I do have to ask you that. We were just talking about uh, Narin and Janaki Ram. Hi, Janaki. And he's asking, uh, uh, what's the association of Staphylococcus aureus and type 2 cytokine? Well, this, I, think, I, think the, I think the evidence out there is pretty good that Staph and Staph X-ray exotoxins or enterotoxins do contribute to an uh, an overexpression of th2 immune responses so they 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 do they moderate and they they upregulate a th2 response and make it even more eosinophilic more th2 and, and i think that's sort of obviously i think my colleague pj wormold and klaus backart's work uh, is part of that and I think I see that in my clinical practice. So when patients get co-colonized with Staph aureus, their condition flares. It flares more than just an infective flare. It's their, their amount of inflammation and everything else increases as well. So I do think sort of co-colonization of Staph aureus in whatever super antigen way that has been described is probably part of that whole, that whole process. But it's amazing though that we, in this microbiome studies, it's not as if Staph aureus stands out as some amazing abundant bacteria in these patients, at least, at least not consistently across studies. He was, he was in fact uh, asking about his type two cytokine signaling uh, with the Staphylococcus aureus. Another question that comes from uh, uh, Nigeria, this uh, colleague of us is asking, uh, what are the lung and sinus uh, does they have the, the same uh, microbiome? I don't, I, I don't I, I've actually, I have read about that. The people have looked at it, um, but I cannot tell you off the top of my head what, what the data there is. Like, like I know what you're asking, how, how closely does the lung and the sinus co correlate with each other? Uh, I, honestly, I can't answer that. We'll have to have someone who knows the field a little bit better. But I, I actually, I, I've read about it, I, but I can't tell you off the top of my head. Um, just uh, because of you cited about the EPOS 2020, and this is just new, and uh, um, our colleague Jana Karam is going to talk about some of this, the new EPOS classification and uh, new changes. However, I would like to ask from you, do you think that uh, EPOS 2020 make a major uh, differences about this microbiome um, situation? No. So the microbiome really is so thin on the research, in my opinion. It, it doesn't, it barely breaks the surface in EPOS 2020. Because EPOS 2020 has 
a plethora of well-grounded research, very well-established mechanisms between disease and symptoms and clinical phenotypes that we see. And that's why the, the new EPOS classification system talks about uh, localized versus diffuse disease, but, and also the concept of a TH2 dominant and a non-TH2 dominant disease process is actually very important because the, this is where the research really is. The, the microbiome is incredibly thin compared to traditional research. And so there, there is, there's some, there's some, there's half the page in there in, in 600 pages <laughs> on microbiome. Uh, one of the questions that comes from uh, Holland, uh, our female um, uh, colleagues is asking, uh, do you think that early childhood microbiome will change in an adult period? Yeah, so let me pull up. I wonder if I've got a slide. Yeah. This one. So it's been well described that the microbiome does change over the lifespan of a human. So when you're at birth, it, it correlates very closely to the up. This is for the upper airway, nasal microbiome. It correlates with the birth canal and then it becomes more like uh, it gets it gets in sync with uh, breast milk. And then as we develop as an adult and then into middle age and eventually elderly, you actually see the, the microbiome change uh, over time. So there actually has been quite a lot of research um, into this. Uh, I quote that little, you can see the reference there, the microbiome, the upper respiratory tract in health and disease. Nice study talks about some of that. Once again, though, these are descriptive studies just showing that these are the observed changes. They don't actually mean anything yet to us. You know, we're, this, this world is so novel. All we have here is really just a description. Like, like what the clouds look like on a sunny day versus a rainy day. This is about the extent. What actually makes the weather work? We still have no idea when it comes to the microbiome. Like that too. <laughs> um, one of the questions coming from France, uh, these uh, colleagues is asking about uh, the, one of the interesting fields that I would like to, I'm, I'm studying on it, on cystic fibrosis. Uh, and uh, he's asking, do you think that Pseudomonas aeruginosa you know, exacerbation uh, because of sinus infection will lead to a changes in the microbiome in the lungs? Uh, I don't know about that, but, but there is a lot of research in cystic fibrosis on their microbiome. And there's a lot of discussion about the microbiome being established very early on in cystic fibrosis sufferers lifespan. Um, and it does link between upper and lower parts of the airway. Um, I don't know how it relates to infection though. I'm not aware of any research into that. But, but it has been heavily researched to show that, uh, that, that there is a lot of correlation there between being established early and also being in sync with the lower airway. But, but that's a group that, that has a sort of an underlying condition that predisposes them. And then they, they all get a very standardized sort of approach and treatment until they eventually get a transplant. So they get a lot of antibiotics and similar type of antibiotics. Okay, so due to lack of time, I would like to congratulate you for this brilliant presentation. I know that I should have uh, been involved you in some uh, surgery or uh, surgical treatment, but I'm, I was very fascinated about this topic, uh, and I considered to put you in a in a difficult situation because of this uh, the changes that are coming at uh, the time. So I really appreciate your much effort that you put in this. Uh, uh, classification and putting all these data together, which uh, you did brilliantly. But uh, <clears throat> as previously said, I would like also to have you for some live surgery. And, uh, and I do believe that uh, we can guarantee some of, uh, some of them in the next future. So thank you, Professor Harvey, for being with us. And uh, if you, uh, if you uh, let, let me uh, please uh, 
have uh, your um, email or is there any places where our colleagues can uh, reach you for any questions? Yeah, no, absolutely. I, I will put these slides up uh, on my YouTube channel um, and you're very welcome to contact me by email at richard at richardharvey.com.au. Um, yes, I, I, I've got uh, this, this week, I'll put these slides up along with the EPOS 2020 classification system, which we worked to develop recently. So uh, look out for that and thanks very much for having me. Thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, this uh, conversation will also be uh, published on a podcast. So for the people who, who wouldn't be able to join that, uh, it will be able also on major Spotify and uh, Apple uh, podcast. Uh, I, I would like also to uh, invite you all once again for the next uh, 15 of uh, March, because uh, we are going to have another guest. Uh, this time is going to be one of uh, my brother, is uh, Paolo Battaglia, who is going to talk about uh, uh, his uh, endoscopic approaches to the infratemporal fossa. So I will see you uh, in uh, uh, for the 15th. Thank you, Richard, for being with us and uh, have a nice Sunday. Thank you. Thank you.